So, good morning. Um, today I'm going to talk about bimodal experiments. And um, that is um, one topic that I've been working with experimentally a couple of years. Um, data evaluation still has its uh, challenges. Um, after that part, I'm going also to talk about um, um, data frames and how to store and handle all the features that we produce in our um, evaluations and analysis. So, um, first of all, well, uh, literature. Uh, John Ross always comes back, uh, gives some good guidelines on how to do stuff. If you want to go into depth, you probably take some other book. Uh, on top of that, um, I have a couple of books uh, that I were, was digging out uh, on data fusion. So a couple of books by Michel. Um, one is data fusion, giving the more general concept of um, how to uh, fuse data not necessarily images. And then there is another book by the same author uh, talking about image fusion and how to uh, bring uh, images together into, uh, from different sources together. Um, another one which is a little bit more, I would say, detailed. It's, a, it's more a collection. I, I'm not sure really if it's um, conference proceedings or something because it's uh, many contributors in that book, but it um, has got a lot of uh, interesting ideas to work with. An important topic in um, data fusion is image registration. So I'm bringing up um, the book by Gostabi again. And um, one thing I'm very interested in seeing what it look, will be is a book um, that will be published first in July this year on Springer Verlag. Uh, I'm pretty curious of what they're going to uh, describe and show in that book because that's about um, 10 years later or eight years later than um, all the other books. So I, I'm hoping the latest 10 years will be covered within this new book. But uh, let's see and get surprised what, what they can bring. Um, we are now getting closer and closer to the end of this uh, class. And um, previously, we have been talking about the image enhancement, uh, how to clean the images, understanding images and their histograms, um, different automatic methods, how to analyze and um, segment images, which brings us to component lab labeling and um, uh, single shape analysis, also working with uh, more complicated shapes. And um, then uh, there was a lecture about dynamic experiments. And um, this is, this today's lecture is somehow related to that one because it's actually reporting more about um, ex the experiment issue and some ideas around that. Um, important that lecture was the image registration, uh, which we are also going to mention today. Um, last week I was talking about statistics and how to plot the data and um, well that brings us to today's lecture. And today I'm going to talk first about uh, motivation, why and how to acquire different data, um, scientific goals, what you want to achieve with it, and then the important thing when you have uh, multimodal data is you want to fuse the data and that is one topic I'm going to put some uh, time on. Uh, one of the fusions uh, alternatives is the bivariate segmentation. And um, then the last topic is a technical topic, uh, managing data tables and how to work with uh, the pandas data tables. Uh, so, we have plenty of different uh, imaging experiments with different uh, challenges. Um, today's lecture will be pretty neutron focused because it's uh, a lot coming from my work and I'm working with neutron imaging. Um, so the examples you see right now are from neutron imaging. Uh, so we have different uh, experiment topics, uh, soil uh, hydrolo hydrology, cultural heritage, building materials and material science. 
and um, there's always uh, problems uh, to get um, better segmentation accuracy and uh, to estimate water content look at which different materials are present in the uh, in the samples also uh, a big problem with the um, real samples is they don't behave always as you want them to so one thing is that they can um, change the dimensions or so um, in for example materials like wood or soil uh, if you add water it will swell and um, then you don't know anymore what is the reason for the particular uh, change in attenuation coefficient is it material that moved or was it water coming into the sample so um, this gives us a little bit amb ambiguous readings in um, in the values and um, that also then propagates through the whole chain of uh, analysis that we don't really know what is the reason why it changed here so um, then we can start asking ourselves what is the reason to select this particular modality so the good side is we can get a good transmission with that particular method we have also great contrast um, relevant features they are actually visible to some degree at least and the different materials can be uh, identified clearly and um, then we are really happy that is the perfect modality for us uh, on the other side there can be problems like low transmission so we can't penetrate the sample maybe the contrast between different features in the image they uh, are not really as good as you would like to have it uh, maybe it can be that all features are not visible so the contrast between uh, two features is too little or it can be that they are too small um, or something like that so um, then we have to change something to something different um, it could be that the modality as such could deliver sufficient contrast it could um, also have good con um, transmission but if you can't resolve the features you want to see then you can't uh, use that modality so you have to check out uh, this plus and minus list and uh, finally also forgot to say the ambiguous uh, response that i mentioned before so until now uh, in this class we have only talked about collecting image features from a single modality and um, maybe that is not sufficient or maybe the solution is adding more information from uh, something somewhere else it could be just sensor information like uh, temperature um, level of um, or the flow rate through a sample or something like that but it could also be um, an, a different imaging modality so now let's uh, look at what is the aim of uh, multimodal imaging so it's the ultimate goal is to match the advantages of each um, method uh, against the, the disadvantages of other methods and in the end we hope to get something that provides more information than um, each individual modality as such oh, and with that we could possibly extend the range of operation so maybe push the resolution a little bit using the higher resolution of one modality to predict uh, details in in the other mod uh, modality which couldn't resolve uh, the features um, we can also talk about extending spatial and temporal coverage that um, one method is capable of um, making large frames while the other one maybe not and then you have to combine that in a smart way uh, also temporal that one can acquire faster than the other one um so those are um some um say acquisition parts um the other one is um reduced uh, uncertainty in the measurement um making the error bars smaller because you add more information hopefully you can use this to compress um the error bars uh, also increased in reliability um maybe you do a segmentation in one uh, modality 
and uh, possibly also in the other one, but um, it's not sh sure that uh, they provide the exact or the perfect answer. So by combining them, we can hope to um, actually produce a more reliable segmentation result. And of course, that uh, gives us more uh, robust system performance. So for me, the natural uh, slide to show is uh, the different modalities um, of neutron and X-rays together. And here you can see uh, two different um, images of the same object. So we here have the neutron image uh, radiography of a, of a camera and uh, an X-ray radiography of, of the same camera. Um, and you can see that some features like uh, the plastic is very nicely enhanced within the neutrons, while uh, other things um, like metal components are less um, visible. And those are more, much more visible within the X-rays. So you can balance the two of them uh, against each other in this case. And you can also see it from the periodic table that there is no linear combination between the two modalities. So what I'm showing here is uh, attenuation coefficients. And um, I try to shade it uh, according to how much um, uh, transmission there is through. So for example, for, for neutrons, hydrogen, our lightest element, has a pretty high contrast, whereas lead down here uh, has a rather low um, attenuation coefficient. This would be the op opposite for, for the X-rays, which um, easily fly, fly through uh, the hydrogen, but is completely blocked by, by the lead. Uh, this is an extreme case. Um, usually we don't use that particular case because the, the X-ray would be too much blocked by the hydrogen, no, by, by, the, by the lead. So we are usually taking more moderate combination. You shouldn't starve out um, the combination because then you would have a, a, a gap in, in your data more or less. Uh, for medical imaging, there are a lot of uh, combinations to consider. Uh, you have MRI um, and uh, normal, normal X-ray CT that you can fuse together. Uh, can also get the MRI combined with um, PET or SPECT. And then, then the fusion, you can see there is a combination where you can have a guided uh, st uh, structures from uh, the MRI. And then you can see uh, the functional part from the PET and uh, SPECT where the brain is working, so to say. So um, this is a nice visualization example of, of um, medical fusion. Um, this paper here uh, gives a nice uh, overview of um, all, uh, all, all, a lot of different uh, fusion techniques in medical imaging. And the figure is actually from this paper. Another one is uh, working with grating inflammatory. Then you use actually the same uh, radiation type throughout, but uh, thanks to um, the um, instrumental setup, you get additional images. And the question is, is if you can, if and how you can fuse these two. So you have the transmission image, which you already know a lot about. Um, then you can get the differential phase and you can get dark field contrast. And um, the idea would be then to combine these um, different images into giving more clear statement of the samples, maybe ha as a guidance for the segmentation um, or something like that. And uh, of course, uh, then is the question, what do you want to fuse? Is that you want to fuse a physical interpretation or you only want to fuse for the segmentation purpose? That is uh, for you to say. Uh, in some cases, the only, f uh, the f the clear, uh, only fact that you can do the segmentation combined may already help you. Uh, in other cases, you really want to do some uh, uh, physical uh, modeling around the sample, and then you would get more information through this. Uh, another one would be to um, do fusion uh, from spectroscopic imaging. So we, um, 
if we have can have a, a source that can provide different energies selected uh, then you can also fuse those together uh, we, we're talking a little bit about um, for example principal component analysis where you can combine uh, the different um, say energy bins into um, one image or a few less images and with that also making conclusions so this could also in a way be seen as a multimodality um, then you can also have uh, different further modalities and also different mod um, dimensionality I, I mentioned a little bit earlier that um, you have um, maybe sensor information which gives you just points in time and that you want to match together with um, maybe three-dimensional or even four-dimensional data to uh, make predictions and combine those together so that could be for example on temperature flow rate pressures or something like that that you uh, add into the images sometimes you only have um, single radiographs and want to match that against uh, the CT data other cases you may have a surface scan uh, of the sample um, using um, one of these uh, laser guided su uh, surface um, measurement techniques um, in other cases you can also have um, a tomography uh, of the sample itself and then uh, using a second technique you can look at the gamma uh, spectrum and uh, at that specific level and then you would have like a axial uh, distribution of elements and on each slice you can do some conclusions so um that were a lot of um, possibilities that you have with um, acquiring data uh, now let's take a look at the fusion and uh, first of all what is data fusion the definition according to uh, Michel is a theory, uh, theory, technique and tools which are used in order to combine all this data information and uh, it not, doesn't even have to be clear, uh, direct data but it can also be uh, data derived from other sensory data and um, the idea is to bring it together into a single uh, common representation format and of course when we do something to the data we have an aim and in this case it's actually to improve um, the quality of the data so that, that it's at least well, I would say it's better than uh, if you would use one source individually so what our gain, uh, goal here is to have that one plus one is more than two that would be the, the aim of, of this uh, um, fusion. Otherwise, it would be a pretty expensive playing, um, only adding more data, which is requires storage, but also uh, bringing in the second uh, technology uh, for, for the instrumentation. That's also pretty expensive. So if you don't gain anything, don't do it. In some cases, it can be for exploring purposes that you want to check. Okay, I see something. Uh, can we combine it? Um, but in the full experiment planning, you should really check is there a true gain in adding uh, the second modality? For fusing data, there is no golden recipe. Um, in the beginning, when I started doing data fusion, um, there was always like, can you give me the, the way to, to fuse the data? But it's not. Um, first of all, there are different strategies. What, and the, the strategies are sh chosen depending on what you want to do. So it could be multivariate fusion that all uh, data are combined in some statistical framework together using more or less the same importance, same technique on all data. Uh, in other cases, you can, what I call augmented fusion, is um, that you have different uh, function for different modalities, like uh, with x-rays and neutrons, x-rays maybe they are really good at seeing the structures of the sample, 
uh, while uh, the neutrons may see the water distribution. And then, of course, there is a gray zone in between, which both see. But then you could use uh, the x-rays to get the structures, segmenting, uh, to guide where you should look at uh, within the neutron data. Uh, you can also use um, diffusion as a way to get rid of artifacts from the measurements. And um, one way is to use um, the second modality to fill in the blanks uh, or guide that to see that, well, uh, in, in the detection process and how if you see an outlier in one modality and you don't see it uh, in the other modality, then something is not really uh, correct. Of course, you have to put some more knowledge in just saying that there is an outlier here and not here, because it could actually be that the sample would provide this outlier. So um, you have to have some strategy here to, uh, to detect the, the outliers and, all fill it, and also to fill in the blanks. And of course, um, dealing with data um, and computers, it's usually the combination of different methods that brings you to the, to the good uh, result in the end. You can also see from all the Kaggle uh, ex um, competitions uh, how uh, people have combined this and this and that and on top uh, adding a spoon of the next um, uh, method to do the cleanup, etc. So um, the whole fusion strategy is depends on, first of all, which modalities you have, uh, sample composition, what um, are the objectives of the, uh, of the experiment as such, and also, to some sense, the condition of the data. If you have a very low signal-to-noise ratio, you may consider a different technique, possibly. It depends. Um, or you may need to add some extra processing on, on, on one modality to, to bring it into the condition that you can use for the fusion. Um, Michel also talks about um, different levels of fusion. So the easiest one is, uh, or the most straightforward one is data to data. So you have two modalities, compare them pixel wise or something like that. Um, next level would be to compare data pixels against different feature properties, or you can take it one even one level higher. So then you already have extracted features, and um, you have reduced the data amount quite a lot already. And uh, with them, you can now fuse and combine uh, to get uh, more information on the fe feature level. So that would be. Uh, different properties of the fear of the um, that you have extract from the two modalities and then you combine those the higher levels are going towards feature versus decision then we go towards uh, the random tree idea that we have a lot of different decisions based on um, on the modalities and then you try to combine them um, or combine them with features and uh, uh, getting the more information or the, the final result out of that. Uh, the process, um, how to do um, image fusion is uh, first, of course, we have the image acquisition, getting images, um, maybe even in different shapes. Um, and the first step is to do a registration between the images. So doing a lot of rotations, translations, scaling until the two modalities uh, have are aligned on the same grid and um, possibly you need to do some cropping. Uh, then you need to do, uh, then the next step would be to do the, the pixel fusion and um, then you have some temporal alignment, uh, calibration uh, to balance out so the scales of the intensities um, work well and then you start doing some combination on the pixel level and um, feature then you first have to extract the features and then you may already have done some of this work uh, in before you get into this position don't possibly you don't have to but um, that would be a, a workflow that you 
go from this to this. Um, also, again, here, you may do some calibration of the intensities. And uh, finally, you have the decision fusion that you have some image labels in, in, in the images already, and those you want to combine in some way. Um, how you combine it is usually a question of what you want to achieve. So it's uh, hard to say you should add, you should multiply, you should um, do some uh, function of this and bring it into the other one. It always depends on how you can really uh, get the, the answers out of the data and hopefully also with some physical meaning behind it. Um, afterwards, when we've done the fusion, we can start doing some statistics, uh, modeling, or we can also use it for presentation display. So here is the, the distinction between uh, quantitative and uh, qualitative uh, presentation of the fusion. Uh, unfortunately, we can also do wrong. So that is uh, labeled as catastrophic fusion. The combination of the modalities could end up in something that provides less information than the individual mo modalities. And it can be caused of selecting the wrong variables. So in principle, going back to the experiment design saying, okay, I shouldn't have done that at all. Possibly is a too complex combination of different um, uh, modalities and other signals. And with that, you get confusing results. And it could also be that the sensor information as such is canceling each other somehow. And uh, well, you know the typical uh, saying that the more uh, chefs you have, the worse the soup will be in the end. So just be careful and watch out, be a little bit critical on what you're doing to avoid the, the case that you do a catastrophic fusion. Um, I already mentioned the image registration, just a little reminder. So um, what we have is one fixed image. In this case, I, I selected the neutron image. And um, then I have a moving image that I try to match. And um, at some point, uh, this matching uh, means that you have rotated it. You may have translated a little bit. And of course, you may need some scaling as well. And in the end, you have the two images or images from the two modalities um, on the same grid. And then you can start doing comparisons on the pixel level. Uh, in some cases, when you have, for example, time series of uh, bimodal data, then you need even to do a registration within each modality to make sure that the data is on the same place. And um, you have different approaches of getting uh, to making this uh, registration. One is to use um, some tool um, doing manual or guided registration where you introduce um, landmark fiducial points that you can um, hang up your uh, registration on. And um, this is often used as a course pre-registration before you go into the automatic registration because if if it's too wild away then um, many algorithms uh, end up uh, automatic algorithms they end up in local minima and think it's yay i got it but uh, in the reality it's far far away so in many cases it's, it actually helps to do some uh, course pre-registration um with the automatic reg uh, registration, we're usually doing some kind of iterative uh, process, doing some um, gradient um, traversing um, method uh, based on different um, metrics. And um, if you have multimodality, you have the, also the challenge of some landmarks that you clearly see in one modality, they don't appear at all in the other modality. And that can be confusing also for the automatic registration. So um, this is something that you, you need to build into the metrics when you do this, um, this work. Um, once you have the data registered and want to look at the 
the pixel level um, fusion. Uh, let's start a little bit with a qualitative fusion. So we have done some registration and want to visualize the data together in a nice way. And my colleague, David Mannes, uh, he got um, this uh, very beautiful sword from, um, from the museum in, in Zug. And um, it's a pretty um, complex material combination. So you have steel, you have wood, you have um, uh, amalgam, and um, with only x-rays, you wouldn't see, get all the information out of the data. So you, for example, you wouldn't see the wood very well because it would be completely destroyed by all these uh, amalgam insets. Uh, the insets, on the other hand, they're barely visible on, on the neutron side. So you really have to select, um, combine the two to get the full um, model of, of, this, uh, of this sword. So this, this was, uh, in principle, a lot of uh, hand segmentation. And uh, also, I think, to the main registration was uh, done um, using an interactive technique, what the VG series calling 123 um, registration. So you have to provide different uh, planes, uh, lines, and points. And with those, the registration can take place. Um, let's take a look at some test data. So this is um, a snail shell, as you can see here in this um, uh, 3D rendering. Uh, I did images uh, tomography with both neutrons and x-rays. They are already registered, so we don't have to think about that right now. Uh, now we uh, take a look at what we can do uh, as um, visualization technique. And one is um, to prov uh, provide a checkerboard um, visualization where we mix it in a way that we have modality A, modality B, uh, modality A, B, and so on. And this is a um, good way to get a quality view of how good uh, your registration is. And as demonstration, I can show this on the snail shell where you have uh, the neutron data, x-ray data. And um, this gives a pretty good feedback, at least during your, um, um, during your workflow. Uh, for the publication, I don't think it's uh, the, probably the best way, unless you're really working with segment uh, registration techniques. Then, of course, it makes sense. But um, it's a useful tool uh, in your work. So I want to show it like this. Um, the other way is uh, to do um, color channel mixing, uh, where we use the RGB color channels, where we have uh, one, uh, the one color channel for modality A, one color channel uh, for modality B. And um, then we have the last channel, which as we don't have three modalities. We just take the average intensity of the two. And um, for that, I wrote this little um, function here where I, I play a little bit with the, which color channel is assigned to which image data. And um, in the first way is like the equation is written here. I have image A as uh, red, image B as green, and um, blue is only intensity modulation. Uh, in the next one, I have changed it so that image A is now going to blue and image B is going to green. And you can already see that there is a slight color difference between the two. And um, yet another one is to combine red and blue. And um, I actually, when I used this combination, um, when I found this combination first time, um, I was really happy because um, we, um, that, that is a perfect combination for looking at water and soil. And if you combine it, so you would put um, blue on the neutron channel and red on the X-ray channel. So it's, it's a nice combination, I think, for, for that purpose. Which combination you choose is your choice. Uh, you can take whatever you like, um, as long as it highlights what you want to show. 
but um, traditionally many people just stay at this combination because that's the say the natural one so um, that is uh, what people are mostly showing but I, I I like this a lot the the red and blue now switching to uh, the segmentation we have two sources we have already talked about um, different uh, segmentation techniques and um, today I'm actually going to introduce a new one which we haven't been talking about before so um, first of all let's look at the segmentation if you have a single modality histogram it would possibly plot like the yellow line here which is useless when you want to do segmentation because there is too great overlap here and the number of misclassified would really be too great so um, this is not useful so let's take a look at two modalities um, one each other uh, so we have modality a produces this histogram modality b produces almost the same histogram but you can see that uh, blue and red here are flipped so they are not the same um, so this would correspond to um, the first uh, material and this to the second and reverse so um, it's really a, com a complementary uh, data set in this sense so what we do instead is to look at the bivariate histogram and um, a lot of this ambiguity has been reduced because you can see that there are two very beautiful peaks with a small separation between them and uh, now it would be much much easier to do a segmentation here more or less putting a line in between here and the number of misclassifiers would be reduced radically so that that is the idea of using bivariate um, um, segmentation so let's take a look at um, an example image where we have a soil sample with roots in it. And in particular, what you can see here in, in the, this uh, highlight is that we have a root and some voids. Um, the neutrons consider this as a void, essentially. It's a darker region, but the X-rays thinks it's, it's dense, while the root for the X-rays, they are pretty light material, so they are more or less seen as a void. So you can already see this complementarity between the two. And then the embedding medium is, um, is grayish in both cases. <clears throat> um, what you can see here uh, is that I got quite some copying in the X-ray data, and that we will see later is actually pretty disturbing for, for the segmentation example that I did. So let's take a look at the bivariate histogram of these uh, roots. Um, I actually put the counts in logarithm because we have a great class imbalance. The roots themselves, they are a small, small fraction of the total volume. So without doing the logarithm uh, visualization, I would barely see them. But uh, now in the logarithm scale, you can see that the histograms for the modalities separated. And um, you can see that there is a very, it's very hard to separate uh, the different classes. Um, background is rather easy. Then we have the soil and we have the container and uh, we have the roots. So we have four different classes, but in the bivariate histogram, you can at least see these blobs relatively well. And uh, now let's go into the classification. Then we have, um, a, number of classes uh, with different distributions. Uh, typically, let's uh, start just um, assuming the Gaussian distribution, then we would have some uh, average uh, intensity vector and some covariance matrix that describes these uh, uh, different classes. And those we want to combine now or use in a decision scheme for the segmentation. And um, the tool that is used and this is the new thing um, it's in some sense related to um, k nearest neighbor but um, it's anyway different because it's now it's based on statistical models so what the gaussian mixture model is doing is that you'd have a sum of um, a lot of gaussians um, and uh, then some weighting uh, factor here 
and this produces the, the bivariate histogram uh, of the data. And uh, now there are already tools uh, available in, um, in scikit-learn and um, it's um, in the subsection mixture and there is the Gaussian mixture and then you can tell uh, how many components you want to identify in the data and uh, then it tries to find uh, it through an iterative uh, approach uh, with expectation maximization to find uh, different classes. Uh, here in this example, I, I tried first with Gaussian mixture of one class. Okay, it makes a blob in the middle, kind of makes sense. Then I have a mixture here with two classes and it actually graphs pretty well the position of the two um, distributions I added. If you then add more classes, then they start, uh, the method starts to split the groups into smaller groups. And then you can ask, does it really make sense to use that many classes? So um, there you have to be a little bit careful about um, how you can do this. Um, the Gaussian mixture model is only the first step. Um, now you have only identified uh, the statistical distributions of each class. So uh, now we want to, oh, that one didn't have space enough. Let's try see if I can try it again. No, yeah, it worked, good. Um, so now we have to look at um, uh, distances um, between the measured points. So the pixel you want to have a class classification on and the different classes you have. And the basic one is just to um, see the distance, the Euclidean distance uh, from the point to the different average vectors you have in, the, in, um, in your training data. This is a good starting point, but it doesn't take into account that uh, the classes have distributions that may be oriented in different ways and that would possibly give, um, um, make the decision, in, in boundary cases, it would possibly make a difference uh, in how uh, the decision is made. So um, for that, we added um, the Mahana Lubis um, distance, which introduces the covariance matrix of the class into the calculation. And already this gives you a better um, this, uh, distance measurement. And um, then if you already, if you have the covariance matrix of both the measurement, the point you want to investigate, and also of the classes you want to compare to, then you can use the Bhattacharya uh, distance for uh, doing this measurement. It's pretty complex. And um, I would say for most imaging cases, this is probably the most uh, relevant one. But uh, once you have go up one level um, to um, looking at feature or decision comparisons, then you can start using Bataseria. But for the pixel level uh, distance, I think Mana Lubis is more dedicated. So looking a little bit at um, a graphical representation of this, you can see we have a, a measured dot here and we have the center point of the two classes. And um, now we have to measure the Euclidean distance to, uh, between these two. Um, as you can see here, there is a confusion. It's almost the same distance, but which one should, should I take? So that's the ambiguity within the Euclidean distance. But if you start using the Mahana Lubis distance, you can see that this one doesn't even touch the point, while this one is more likely to touch it. So we have a much higher uh, likelihood that the point belongs to the, the narrow class. Uh, with Bataseria, you would even add some um, search region around the, the, the measured point and then the overlap could be more clear. So these are the three um, different um, metrics that you can use for you, uh, measuring the distances. And this is where you come to the nearest neighborhood uh, classification um, similarity that you actually are comparing distances to, um, to different uh, 
uh, neighbors. But now we're talking about class uh, distances to classes instead instead of distances to individual pixels in the training. Um, now I tried to do a segmentation of the root data. And um, I had these uh, four classes as they are now. Uh, the decision space uh, looks something like this. So we have the roots, we have container, soil, and the, um, the background, the void. As you can see, uh, the roots were pretty good segmented here. The soil is pretty good in the, in the general. Um, but here, and that is thanks to the coupling we had in the X-ray data, the roots are confused with being a container. And we also have the typical problem of um, the unsharp edges that we, we say that there is some soil between the container and, um, and the void. So it's not the perfect um, segmentation yet, but um, so there is a lot of room for improvement here, but um, that is to come. Um, an idea what you can do uh, with, the, with the bivariate data is that you can actually work with the attenuation coefficients. So the attenuation coefficient at a certain pixel is a sum of the contributions of the different uh, materials. And um, in principle, you would be able to set up an equation system uh, like this or many equation systems if you, if you have many points. And from that, be able to do even um, make an attempt on um, getting the mixing, mixing ratio within each pixel. So that would be sub-pixel separation, actually. Um, this is an idea that um, I'm going to work along um, in the next years. So it's not yet uh, completely worked out. But anyway, an idea to, to work along. So, and with that, actually, it's time for a break. Um, do you mind five minutes or you want longer? Five minutes, okay. Thumbs up. Five minutes, sounds like. Yeah, good. So, uh, I just make a short break in the recording and. Um,